Religion has profoundly influenced the sweeping American narrative, perhaps more than any other force in our history, from the time before European colonization to the present. The Startup National Museum of American Religion is working to build a museum in the nation's capital that will share the story of what religion has done to America and what America has done to religion, inviting all to explore the role of religion in shaping the social, political, economic, and cultural lives of Americans, and thus America itself. I'm your host, Chris Stevenson. Join me for our 12-part podcast series, Religion and the American Experience, as we follow scholars deep into America's religious history and learn how it can inform and animate us as citizens, grappling with the complex questions of governance and American purpose in the 21st century. Episodes will be released every Monday between now and the end of the year on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Once again, America is reckoning with racism, this time in the wake of George Floyd's death. 2020 is a point near to us on the long historical timeline of both black slavery and racism in the United States, which includes the secession of Southern states in 1860 and the calamitous civil war which followed, killing more than 600,000 Americans and raining down disaster and ruin on the young nation's homes and communities. We are very grateful to have Professor Mark Knoll with us today to plumb the depths of his book, The Civil War is a Theological Crisis, hoping that this will help us all better understand the reckoning America has undertaken. Dr. Knoll is an American historian specializing in the history of Christianity in the United States. He holds the honorary position of research professor of history at Regent College, having previously been the Francis A. McEnany Professor of History at the University of Notre Dame. Mr. Knoll was awarded the National Humanities Medal in the Oval Office by President George W. Bush in 2006. He is the author of many books, including Protestantism, A Very Short Introduction, God and Race in American Politics, A Short History, and America's God from Jonathan Edwards to Abraham Lincoln. Mark, thank you very much for being with us. Oh, it's my privilege. Mark, to frame the Civil War as a theological crisis, in the early part of your book, you write of religious habits of mind and the structure of biblical interpretation as very important to bring us to this point. Can you summarize what these are and what they meant to America on the eve of the Civil War? Certainly. The American habits of mind go back into the colonial period when, of course, the American colonies were part of Britain's worldwide empire. In uh, the colonies, uh, public life was infused with the Bible. Public life had many other dimensions, but the scriptures were part of the British self-awareness. And in conflict with France, Britain always said that it was defending liberty and Protestantism as against French tyranny and, and the Catholic Church. So that Protestant biblicism was built into American consciousness before there was in the United States. In addition, the colonial period had a long history of belief in God's special providence for the British Empire, and that continued right on into the history of the United States. So we have, coming up to the middle years of the 19th century, as the tension grew between North and South, we have both areas of the country believing that they can understand how God determines the events in human history. And as conflict came closer, those white Southerners who felt that it was necessary to break from the United States felt that they were doing God's will in breaking away just as the children of Israel had done. There was an early sermon by a, a Confederate pastor who talked about Abraham Lincoln as Pharaoh and the Confederates were the people of Israel. Of course, it was just the, the opposite in, in the North, where the, the largely literate population felt, many of them, that it was God's providence to preserve the Union and thereby preserve the testimony of the United States as a free republic to the world. So you had one common heritage of believing that the United States was providentially guided by God, divided amongst itself. And in the same way, you had the, the strong biblical background of the British colonies leading into a very, very widespread 
awareness and trust in the Bible in the new United States and biblical interpretation, particularly on the question of whether God permitted slavery, was sharply divided. That divide was not strictly north and south because there were a lot of white northerners who also believed that the Bible allowed for slavery. But there was a very sharp clash uh, between those who felt that scripture allowed or even encouraged slavery and those who felt that, that the Bible either discouraged or absolutely outlawed slavery. So one, one common tradition led to a division of mind. Moving into the crisis over the Bible, which you talked about briefly there, could you succinctly explain how the Bible was used to defend slavery on the one hand and abolitionism on the other, and how these arguments were viewed generally by Americans at that time? Yes, it's, it's fairly straightforward to talk about what arguments were used by pro-slavery people when they turned to scripture and anti-slavery people when they turned to scripture. The background is the widespread recognition and use of scripture in the early years of the uh, American uh, Republic. The key factor here is that the United States did away with Christendom. It did away with uh, a national established church. Most of the states did away with the established church quite soon after uh, 1776. Connecticut and Massachusetts took, took a little longer. Um, there wasn't, was not going to be any nationwide official support for religion. Well, how would religion flourish? Uh, what, what, would, what would there be to support the churches? The answer was extensive use of scripture to encourage evangelization and then promotion of scripture as the means of preserving the virtue without which republics fall. One other preliminary word to say is that until the 1830s, 1840s, Protestant faith is just overwhelmingly dominant. From the 1830s and 40s, there's a live Catholic minority that has an option in how the Christian faith is used, but it's still fairly small and relatively weak in terms of public um, uh, support. So we have this Protestant background with a great emphasis upon the uh, scriptures. When in the 1820s, early 1830s, there are strong anti-slavery voices, there is an immediate response. The anti-slavery voices came from David Walker, 1829, a free black merchant in Boston who published a vigorous track uh, denouncing the idea that the United States could be in any sense a Bible nation if it treated its black people the way it treated. And in early 1831, William Lloyd Garrison la launches the newspaper, The Liberator, which in its early days used scripture as one of its weapons to attack the slave system. There had been a scriptural defense of slavery before that time, but but from about 1830 onwards, the scriptural defense of slavery becomes very vigorous and very strong. And here's how it's worked. And remember, this is America where it pays to be effective in public speech. To, uh, the, the people who use the Bible to defend slavery would respond to arguments against slavery of any kind by saying, look, you read the Bible for yourself. Doesn't the Mosaic law in the 25th chapter of the book of Leviticus say that Israelites who capture non-Israelites may enslave them for their life and also pass on the enslavement to their children. What could be more obvious than that Moses, the great lawgiver, defended slavery? And by the way, in the Old Testament, haven't you noticed that Abraham, the father of our faith, had slaves? That was one argument. A second argument was to turn to the New Testament epistles. The Apostle Paul, uh, in, in, as, as it was considered to be the author of the, most of the New Testament epistles, on several places says, servants, obey your masters in the Lord. There was a brief debate, 1830s, 1840s. Was this word that's translated servant in the King James Version? Could, did that really mean something like an indentured servant or was it a slave? And pretty soon, uh, learned opinion said, well, it might mean several things, but it certainly included the meaning of ownership of a body, ownership of a, of a person. Uh, so the Apostle Paul seems to get along fine with slavery. 
a, a passage in 1 Corinthians 7 is pointed to very often. The apostle says, if you're in bondage and are given the chance to be free, go ahead and take it. But if you're not, simply accept it. And then there is, of course, the little book of Philemon, where an escaped slave is sent back to, uh, uh, Onesimus is sent back to his master. So reading, reading the Apostle Paul, people said, what, what could be more obvious? Look, you just read the Bible for yourself. And then the, the uh, third argument, which became stronger as the uh, century wore on, look at the person of Jesus. Our master and Lord altered, refined, developed many Old Testament teachings but said not a single word about slavery. Jesus on many occasions said, you have heard that it was written, but I tell you, never did he say those words about slavery. So it's just, it's just obvious to anyone who reads the Bible that uh, slavery was either accepted or even favored in, in scripture. Now, the anti-slavery people had a, had a vigorous response. Pro-slavery Bible people could, could uh, quote individual scripture passages, so could anti-slavery people. The one that was uh, singled out a lot came in uh, uh, Exodus, where Moses in a list of prohibited, prohibited acts says, man stealing is a crime worthy of death. And then, and then in 1 Timothy chapter 1, there's a kind of repetition. It's not quite so dramatic a statement, but the Apostle Paul, considered to be the author for Timothy, said, man stealers cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Well, do you own a slave? Where did that slave come from? Somewhere along the line, there had to be a kidnapping. Uh, Presbyterian George Bourne in 1816 wrote a big, long book, basically using that as his text. Man stealing is evil. There were, there were other arguments that were taken directly from scripture by anti-slavery people. Very often the golden rule due to others as you would have them do to you uh, w was used to say, well, w would you like to be mistreated like a slave? Would you like to be enslaved? Well, if you wouldn't like to be enslaved, why not uh, recognize that that kind of Bible teaching works against slavery uh, uh, as, as, in its entirety? One of the difficulties of the anti-slavery argument was it could get complicated. So there were, there were anti-slavery people who said, well, yes, we have to read the words of the Bible and trust the words of the Bible. We have to see what the broader context of the words mean. And they're beginning uh, right in the early uh, 19th century with a man named Daniel Coker, who was one of the uh, founders of the African Methodist Episcopal Church with William Allen. And then it, it, several different times along the way, there, there was the argument, look, if, if we want to understand the Mosaic legislation about slavery, we have to understand that the Israelites in their day were set over against the world. But now when Christianity arrives, when Jesus arrives, he, he wants to invite in to Israel all people. So the distinction between Israel and others is wiped out, either actually or, or potentially. And then there were other people who said, well, let's look at other circumstances of, of slavery as it's found in the Bible. And this would be some African-American writers, not too many, but few, and then one or two white writers, a man named John Fee in Kentucky, the founder of Berea College, made this second argument. He said, okay, let's, let's take it for granted that the Bible sanctions slavery. What do we know about slavery as found in the Old Testament? Slave, slavery is found in the New Testament in Roman time. We know one thing, all of the slaves in the Bible are white people. There are no African slaves in the Bible. And here Fee was putting his finger on the, 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 the nationwide white feeling, not that black people weren't human, there were a few people who thought that, not too many that yet, not that black people were human, but somehow they were just a, a lower order of humanity and somehow God had providentially fit Africans to be slaves. John Fee and a few African-American, uh, James W.C. Pennington and other African-American writers, the speaker said, well, wait a minute, there's nothing in the Bible about black slaves. The slaves in the Bible are white. So if you think the Bible sanctions slavery, that I have, as a black person, just as much right to enslave your child as a white person as you have to enslave my child. 
And that argument got absolutely nowhere, although on the face of it, objectively considered, that's a pretty good argument. There's a lot more passages that are drawn on. This is a kind of probably too long, but still a simple uh, explanation for what were the go-to passages for those who felt the Bible clearly attacked, those who felt that the Bible clearly defended slavery. Poignantly, you write this towards the end of the chapter of the crisis over the Bible, and I'm quoting here, the supreme crisis over the Bible was that there existed no apparent biblical resolution to the crisis. It was left to those consummate theologians, the Reverend Dr. Ulysses S. Grant and William Tecumseh Sherman, to decide what in fact the Bible actually meant. Close quote. Would you share with us what went into this summary? Well, the uh, inability of persuasion to uh, bring about a, a conclusion concerning what the Bible taught meant that there never was a conclusion. In fact, one of the uh, uh, themes that I've learned more about since writing this book is how vigorous the pro-slavery Bible argument remained after 1865. A really fine book by a historian at the University of Tennessee, Luke Harlow, shows that right through the 1860s, 70s, and 80s, particularly the Southern white churches would talk about their reliance upon the Bible and they would say, and it happened many different times, well, slavery is now prohibited as the law of the land, but there really was nothing wrong with our arguments in favor of slavery because they were based so exclusively on the Bible. So the, the arguments, among Bible believers, people who shared a common trust in scripture, people who shared in many ways a, a common approach to how to interpret the Bible, resulted in a standoff. So how, how do you convince Southern slave owners who believes the Bible defends slavery that they've got to get rid of slavery? Well, you have to lose the Civil War. And, there, and you pass the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment that, that uh, prohibits slavery and then try to convey rights of citizenship on former slaves. And that's, that's the process that uh, led to that, probably facetious, probably not, not a real helpful comment, but, but the sense that internal arguments from scripture were not sufficient to carry the day. Thank you. Uh, you also explain that the country's inability to distinguish the Bible on race from the Bible on slavery created a crisis that outlived the Civil War. Could you explain what this crisis was? This is a real serious matter and actually brings us close to the present when, when uh, people talk about things like structural racism, which is an easy phrase to throw around, but there's a, there's a history to uh, thinking that in some way, in different terms, uh, black people, people of African descent, somehow rank lower on, on, on some kind of scale. And the, um, the, the failure of basically white dominant study of scripture to come fully to terms with the, the, the general discrimination against, against black people had a, 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 an evil legacy. This is a little bit complicated, but it actually shows how much Bible-based thinking led on to thinking that was really much worse, not based on the Bible. One of the ways that pro-slavery Bible advocates in the antebellum period before the Civil War argued was to criticize slave owners for not instituting what they called a few people called Abrahamic slavery. What was Abrahamic slavery? It, was, it would be white slave owners treating their enslaved people the way that Abraham treated his. How did Abraham treat his? He, he uh, armed them. He protected their marriages. The assumption was he provided for their education. And there were leaders like James Henley Thornwell of South Carolina who, who criticized white slave owners for not taking care of their slaves, humans made in the image of God, by breaking up their marriages, not allowing them to learn to read, 
uh, not providing uh, Christian education, not allowing them to be, uh, be off work on, on the Sabbath. So this, this was a slave defending clergyman who yet said we have Bible standards about the humanity of the slaves. Well, that argument really didn't go too far in the South and it probably didn't convince too many people uh, in the North. After the war, when the, when the pro-slavery Bible argument failed, the racism continued. And what came after the war was in some ways worse. It's called by scholars today, scientific racism. There was a whole uh, movement in, in uh, the United States and, and Britain and the European continent to say, well, you know, when we, when we talk about humankind, when we talk about different groups of people around the world, we, we shouldn't pay too much attention to the Bible. That's just kind of ancient literature and, and it really doesn't have too much to say, but we should be scientific. We should go around and measure skulls. We should measure the angle of people's noses and chins. We should look at hair and we should, we should divide the species of human-like creatures on the earth that way. And not surprisingly, 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, there were real serious, widely respected publications by, they were often called ethnologists, we might call them anthropologists today, who said, you know, if, if you go around the world, you can see that white-skinned people are always the most civilized. And then you would usually have two or three ranks. And then you would get the black-skinned people. They're the least civilized. And some of these scientific racist arguments after the Civil War concluded, well, black people are so inferior to white people that they're probably a different species. They're not really even part, part of, of, of humankind. The, the evil legacy of what happened before the Civil War was that race entered in as a kind of not too often acknowledged part of arguments about slavery. After the Civil War, when the Bible was taken out of the equation, then race prejudice, pure and simple, developed and provided a foundation what were supposedly objective scientific conclusions. So we have a situation where racist opinions, racist assumptions before the war compromised what people could do with scripture, remove scripture from the equation, and the conclusions are often more demeaning, more unfriendly to black people, treating them even not as black people. So that legacy of racial discrimination, racial lowering, before the war, continued on viciously after the war. That's a great uh, summary of, of uh, what I was hoping you would get at. Just as a follow-up to that, and you don't have to qu uh, comment on this, but it's something you wrote in your book that, that captures some of what you just said, and I'll, I'll quote it here. You wrote that, to have carried the country in 1860, the argument that a racially discriminatory slavery was a different thing from slavery per se would have required a kind of commitment to racial anti-prejudice that the nation only accepted after immense struggle late in the 20th century, if in fact it has accepted it even now. I know one place in the book you write that here was a country built up very much on this book, the Bible, yet the Bible itself set the country up to not be able to resolve its greatest conflict and marched it on to war. We're gonna move from the crisis over the Bible to the crisis over providence. And Mark, in this chapter, you write that in the mid 19th century, Americans were children of the enlightenment as well as children of God. Tell us what this means and maybe give us some examples from the North and the South. The Enlightenment quality of American life contributed in many ways. Uh, people know very well that um, John Locke, for example, was a uh, promoter of ideas about equality in government, toleration in government that had some influence, uh, considerable influence in the founding uh, documents, the founding era of the United States. And he's, he's considered a moderate figure of the Enlightenment who believed that reason, uh, fair play, justice were standards that were instituted by God, but more or less left to humankind uh, uh, to, to, to develop. 
certainly one of the great features of, of enlightenment thinking in the 18th century was a, a real confidence in the human ability to figure out what was happening in the world. That confidence had a lot to do with the uh, formation of the United States because it led American patriots to simply have the confidence they knew what Britain was trying to do to them. I think maybe, and this would be a little bit of a contested uh, statement, but, but maybe uh, many historians would say that Britain's rule of the colony was by no means good. It was shoddy, it was uh, heavy handed, but it was not a general conspiracy against the rights of free colonial Americans. Most of the patriots, however, came to think that every misstep that Britain took was a result of a deeply laid conspiracy where the American patriots could see the origins of the evil, see how the evil was working out, see the effects of the evil. In other words, they had a great self-confidence in understanding how the world was working, a great self-confidence that, that they could watch the evidence and from the evidence conclude large-scale conclusions about how everything was working. That confidence in reason combined with trust in the Bible is what I was trying to convey in, in the book. People who trust in the Bible, traditional Christians of all kinds, and this would be Orthodox Christians and Catholic Christians and Protestants, believe that God is in charge of the world. Uh, the distinctive feature of that belief in providence in the early United States was a combination of great confidence that God was ruling the world, plus great confidence in my ability to understand how God was ruling the world. In other words, you had an enlightenment kind of confidence for overlaid on a, a, a basically biblical, biblical Hebraic Christian understanding of God's rule of the world. So that meant that uh, Almost everyone, and this is actually true of people who are more secular. Uh, the great phrase about manifest destiny appears in a tract that is hardly religious at all in the mid 1840s, but it's someone who's using that sense of God controlling everything and what, the way God controls everything shows that the United States is destined to go to the Pacific and be a great nation uh, on the world stage. So you had real confidence in God, but you also had real confidence in the human ability to understand what God was doing. How did this work out in the, in the, by, by the Southern defenders of slavery? One of the arguments they made repeatedly, and particularly the more pious, the more concerned you were about religion, the more often you would hear this argument, is that the presence of converted Africans in America was God's imp imprimatur, God's uh, justification of slavery, because slavery was the means by which Africans came to America and were able to hear the preaching of the gospel. In other words, uh, and by the 1830s and 40s, there was a very substantial and growing African-American Christian community. Never majority and not, not a huge number, it can't be overestimated, but there were a lot of black Christians and slave defenders said, look, isn't it good to have black Christians? Well, of course it's good. Why is it good? Because God allowed the slave system to bring Africans to the new world and have them hear the gospel. Now, this kind of reasoning absolutely infuriated. I mentioned David Walker before, Frederick Douglass in his great uh, speech in Rochester, New York in 1851, and many of his writings and speeches just really hammered on this logic. But it was logic that uh, seemed to convince uh, a lot of people. Now, on the other side, you had a combination, again, of enlightenment, reasoning about how the United States would affect the world and a belief that God had made it possible for the United States to be freed from Britain. This was certainly a belief by George Washington expressed many times in the 1780s. Washington was not a, we would say today in modern terms, an evangelical Christian. He was a God believer. He, he uh, went to church a lot, didn't stay around for the Eucharist, but it was, it was in church. But he said on many times, how did we win our independence? It had to be that God was working, working to bring that about. It wasn't crude, it wasn't crass, but he clearly expressed it. Well, the Northern anti-slavery apologists, Northern apologists for the Union, drew on these, th this early history, 
Abraham Lincoln would actually have something of this view that the United States had a great role to play in the world to show how liberty loving people could get along with each other and, and bring about prosperity and well being for entire populations, unlike the tyrannies of, of Europe. So the Confederacy was seen not just as a political mistake, not just as a political error, but as a political evil because it was undermining. It was trying to thwart what God had brought about by making the American Republic a beacon light uh, to the world. So it was that combination of firm belief in God in control and firm confidence that I could figure out how God was in control that led to this crisis of, of, of uh, providence. Thank you. We have been listening to Mark Knoll help us through the lessons of his book, The Civil War as a Theological Crisis. Mr. Knoll is an American historian specializing in the history of Christianity in the United States and is the honorary research professor of history at Regent College. He was awarded the National Humanities Medal in the Oval Office by President George W. Bush. Mark, would you tell us briefly about Stonewall Jackson and what his participation in the war and his death revealed? Stonewall Jackson, a really intriguing figure, and I think uh, uh, there have been generations of, of historians and then um, and popular writers who have uh, uh, really been fascinated by uh, Jackson. Uh, Jackson is a uh, military person. He's an instructor in a military academy, apparently not a particularly good instructor, but, but not, not a particularly effective instructor, but a very serious-minded person. He was a, a committed Presbyterian, and always in his years as a, a general, uh, would try to look out for the uh, spiritual well-being of, of uh, his troops. He did fight on Sunday, but only he felt when he, when he had to. So he wanted even to honor the Sabbath. He, he uh, was all the time encouraging chaplains to preach to his, uh, the troops, all the time in, encouraging the troops to, not to get drunk, not to visit prostitutes, but to act honorably. And so he was, he was a... Uh, a model of a serious Christian called into military service. And then, of course, he was a dramatically effective military leader. So he was the key person at the first battle of Bull Run to kind of turn the tide against uh, the, the Union forces. And then in many uh, uh, strategic battles thereafter, he was the key, key person, in, or at least a key person. There were, there were some lapses, but a, a key person General Robert E. Lee's key second-in-command, who, who uh, on many occasions saw uh, Southern troops mobilize, maneuver, outmaneuver, and defeat the, the Union. So, so when he is shot by his own troops early in the morning or late in the evening on, uh, in bad uh, visual condition at the Battle of Chancellorsville, and then a few weeks later dies, there's, there's, there's nationwide attention to what uh, this death means. And uh, there have been uh, historians who look carefully at how people responded to the death of Stonewall Jackson. And again, we talked about providence and the, the sense that people had that they could figure out providence. There, there were uh, people in the North who said, uh, we, we regret that this Christian general has been killed, but this means that God is going to give us the victory. There, were, there was the opposite view in some parts of the Confederacy to say God is chastising the Confederacy by taking our great leader away. And there was even a, a, a strain of providential reasoning in the South that went further. And it, it went like this. The South knew it had a great general in, in Stonewall Jackson. And as victory followed victory, there was more and more trust that Jackson would be the person to bring the Confederacy into its independence to throw off the troops from the North and preserve the Southern way of life. But then Jackson is killed. What's the lesson? The lesson is God was teaching us not to trust in human leaders, but to trust in himself. So there, there was a, a number of providential interpretations of this person who was recognized as a, an honorable Christian, serious Christian, and a serious believer in the will of God. Jackson had many eccentricities. Uh, one of them was not to worry too much about uh, 
leading his troops into battle and staying in, 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 in danger because he said, when, it's, when it, God determines it's time for me to die, I'll die. And it won't be until then. It's not what humankind can do for me. He was also, uh, uh, though a firm defender of slavery, he treated uh, Africans uh, as children made in the image of God as he understood it, um, not thinking about the necessity of emancipation, but thinking about relatively kind treatment. So in that perspective, he gained further credit in the South as, as someone who had this kind of respect for, it was always said, his, his servants. So a remarkable individual in himself but even more remarkable as a, a kind of trigger for these varied providential readings of what happened when he actually was killed. Let's move from Stonewall Jackson and uh, providential understanding to Lincoln, which uh, whom you mentioned earlier. So Lincoln's second inaugural includes this statement, the Almighty has his own purposes. What is the significance of this statement in the broad understanding of the Civil War as a theological crisis, and specifically uh, with the crisis right. over providence? He's not typical of any large group in uh, America. Lincoln, uh, as a young man, probably was something of a skeptic. He read works like uh, uh, Tom Paine's Age of Region. There's a French skeptic, Volney. He was probably uh, a little bit loose in how he talked about the churches as uh, fallible. And he certainly didn't like the fact that on the frontier in India, Kentucky and Indiana and Illinois, preachers would fight over each other. So he's a little bit of a skeptic. But as, as he uh, matures in life, he stops saying things that are skeptical. He uh, um, has decent relations with at least some ministers in, in Springfield, Illinois. After one of his sons dies, 1850 or so, uh, the minister of the Presbyterian Church is kind to the family, and Mary transfers her membership from the Episcopal Church to the Presbyterian Church, pastored by this James Smith, who had also written a really big, heavy, not very clear, but interesting textbook defending Christian faith. And Lincoln became something of a friend of this uh, Presbyterian pastor and would occasionally chant, attend worship service, but never become a member and never be. Uh, never be a, a, what we think of the day as, as a committed Christian. He had, though, always from his uh, youth, a strong sense of what some people call fate or just that humankind was not fully in charge of their own, their own uh, fate. And that sense developed. Um, it, be, it became stronger as, as uh, he, he came back into politics after the Kansas-Nebraska struggle the Dred Scott decision, 1857, and as he came to the White House, uh, he's a pretty conventional believer in um, God taking care of America in his early days. Um, uh, the death of his son in the White House, uh, second son combined with all the losses on the, on the battlefield seemed to have made him even more sober and more serious. So uh, what seems to be evolving, and th this would be the conclusion, I think, of the people who really studied Lincoln very carefully. What seems to be evolving is a strong theism, a belief in God, and a belief that there's a divine control of the universe, but it's not Christian faith, and he doesn't have, he does not have, he doesn't express the kind of enlightenment confidence in knowing what God is, is doing. You mentioned the phrase in the second inaugural, which is really striking, that God has his own purposes, when all around him are people who tell him what God's purposes are, as, as they did with the death of Stonewall Jackson. Earlier, in probably the fall of 1862, after uh, Lincoln had decided that in emancipation problem, pro emancipation proclamation, freeing the slaves in the Confederate states was necessary, he was waiting for an opportunity to uh, uh, issued the proclamation. He felt there needed to be some kind of uh, victory on, on the battlefield for a very uncertain time. Probably at that time, he, he wrote a memo to himself that saying that, that uh, people on all sides think they know what God is doing. I, I don't know. It may be that God is not, not on either one of our sides. Later on, his secretaries, Hay and Nikolai, called this the, the memorandum on the divine will. Mm -hmm. 
So it was a kind of thought that uh, was leading him to be humble about understanding what God was doing, but more diligent in, in doing what he thought what was correct. And that was, that was one of the roots that led then to the fruit of this statement in the second inaugural. Lincoln was willing to think that he needed to do what he thought was best, but he should not presume to say what God was doing in this in entire conflict. And then the, the, the ending of the second inaugural address is, is really remarkable too. Uh, he, he talks about charity, about the need to be uh, uh, to do the right thing for the widows and orphans. And he doesn't say North, he, but he just means everyone, uh, widows and orphans, North and, and South. And some people have concluded that Lincoln's ability not to believe he understood providence enabled him to have this sense of charity toward all that he communicated at the, at the end of the second inaugural address. So a very complicated figure, and I, I think no one should try to say, well, I've got Lincoln figured, I, I know exactly what, he's been claimed by everyone from rank secularists to uh, evangelicals, and even there's some people who claimed he was a Catholic, claimed he was a Mason. Uh, the, the real evidence doesn't allow those kind of hard and fast designation. But the good evidence says probably he became more and more convinced of God's control, but never in explicitly or directly Christian terms. You also relate uh, that the Secretary of the Navy, Gideon Wells, uh, wrote notes from the cabinet meeting after the Union victory at Antietam, which allowed Lincoln to issue the Emancipation Proclamation, and reported Lincoln as saying that God has decided this question in favor of the slaves. Can you tell us a little more about this? On that one instance, uh, we have Lincoln talking about being able to understand what God would have him do. Uh, and the fact that it was recorded by these cabinet officers right at that time means that it's, it's credible evidence. Unlike a lot of the good Lincoln and religion stories are published in newspapers in the 1890s or 1910, they sound great, but there are many removes away from what, what actually happened. So that would be the one exception to Lincoln's unwillingness to try to read the mind of God as a, as a prompt or a motive for his actions. Right. Before we leave uh, this crisis of providence, um, I wanted to ask one more question. You note that the Civil War, uh, Mark, occurred during a time of transition uh, from old ways of thinking that included strong threads of religion and religious belief to new ways of thinking that depended less on religion and more on secularism, writing that one of the most important reasons for this change, and I'm quoting here from your book, of convictions over time was the hallowness of prov providential reasoning that was everywhere on display in the war between the states, close quote. What led you to make such a strong declaration? Well, there, was, there was a phenomenon that several historians have written about, that, that after the war, there, there is an increasing number of people, largely now educated, mostly East Coast, but some in, in urban areas in the Midwest as well, who said, look, we had people of all kinds telling us what God was doing. We, we had uh, people who were saying, would God give us a quick victory? Um, they, they reasoned like Lincoln in the second inaugural saying we, we expected a, a quick, easy conflict. We've had to, to terrible bloodshed, terrible carnage. And these thinkers, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. would be a, 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 a prominent one, simply said, well, that, that kind of uh, trust in God was childlike. That, that was just kind of superstition. And we need to have science, the law, sound business practices uh, guide us in, into the future. You can, you can say that the origin of pragmatism as a kind of formal American philosophy begins with something of that rejection of the uh, conventional Christian faith of the era, which was uh, put to use either for the North or for the South, sometimes for the uh, enslaved people to, to, to moving toward freedom. And there was just a, a turn away from that kind of more superficial faith. At the same time, in the years immediately after the, the war, uh, 
There is uh, more awareness in America of scientific developments in, in uh, Britain and the continent. Um, Darwin had published his Origin of Species in 1859, but there's not too much attention to it until after the um, American Civil War. And actually, religious people are not too, too worried about Darwin then. The, the real struggles over evolution come in the 1920s and, and after. But um, the, the Darwinian picture of the world seemed to remove God from direct control of natural life. And that gave some people an impetus to say, well, if, if uh, the, the older way of thinking about God creating every species and God being in the thunder and the tornadoes and, and, the, and the storms, really isn't necessary that maybe we don't need the old kind of theism the old kind of christianity where god is ruling over over everything so the uh, the easy believism the, the my side right or wrong and god is on my side way of thinking that was so prevalent throughout the united states was the doorway for some people to say well we just don't need any of that okay let's move to overseas opinions of the Civil War, which shed some really interesting light on the Civil War as a theological crisis. In your view of Protestant opinions, Protestant opinions from abroad, you note that anti-slavery arguments that did not seem to work in, in the United States exerted crushing force outside the United States. Can you explain why this was the case? Far and away, the majority opinion of very conservative Protestants moderate Protestants, more liberal Protestants, was that things, uh, Bible teachings like the Golden Rule just, just made it unthinkable that in a modern Christian world, you could enslave a whole category of people. In Britain and in France, there was some actually uh, interesting Protestant voices in France, there, there was some strong pushback against the American racism as well. But more generally, the Protestant voices from overseas just, just shook their head and said, well, look, it may have been uh, conventional uh, in the past to just accept slavery, but now we know with the progress of Christian civilization, that could be a liberal way of putting things, but it didn't have to be. And the progress of Christian civilization is just clear that you can't take basic liberty away from people and then call yourself a, a Christian. Mark, you found Catholic opinion even more fascinating, I think, uh, yes. uh, from abroad, uh, as you wrote, and I'm quoting here, Catholics were able to raise possibilities beyond the imaginations of American Protestants. Can you share some of these? Well, it, they're, they're almost self-evident if you stop to think about the structure of Catholic uh, organization, Catholic faith, and the structure of Protestant faith. Um, what I discovered in uh, learned journals in Germany and Italy, and I got some friends to help me read the, the Italian, uh, were these long arguments about how a democratic approach to Bible interpretation meant that you had no authoritative Bible. If everyone was free to just read the Bible on their own and to make their own conclusions about it, then there would be inevitably cacophony, confusion. So you can imagine, the Catholic author said, what we, what we see in the United States is a perfect case for the requirement that an authority, a Christian authority, interpret the Bible for everybody. And of course, they, they, a few people talked about the papacy as being that institution with the bishops in the Catholic Church who could interpret the Bible um, de definitively. The uh, Jesuits' main magazine in, 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 in Italy, Civiltà Cattolica, and a real long article right at the start of the Civil War on Mormonism, saying, look, here, here is what all Protestantism leads to. It leads to one individual, Joseph Smith, pretending to be a new Bible writer, and soon all Protestants will move in that direction. And what the Mormons and American Protestants need is a comprehensive authority so that they can, yes, follow the scriptures, but follow it cohesively, coherently. After writing this book, I've, I've actually been able to read uh, uh, a lot of American Catholic newspapers, and they, they do not have long learned articles, uh, Catholic publications just getting off the ground by the mid 19th century. 
but there are echoes of that that argument. Uh, real sharp criticism against, uh, particularly New England anti-slave people, and then criticism of Confederate pro-slavery people, and saying, "Look, these people are just hitting each over their head with the Bible, and they need a comprehensive authority like the church to help them understand what what the Bible Bible means." Mark, you conclude your book with this, and I'm quoting. The theological crisis of the Civil War was that while voluntary reliance of the Bible had contributed greatly to the creation of American national culture, that same voluntary reliance on Scripture led only to a deadlock over what should be done about slavery. After the shooting stopped, two great problems in practical theology confronted America. What were they and what are their implications? The first and most obvious problem was uh, obviously slavery was gone but the, uh, the the sense that african people were somehow less something than white people remain and that that's been just a, a feature of american life uh, to, to our own day the second problem had to do however with the uh, changes in american life that were uh, beginning before the civil war and in some ways accelerated by the civil war bringing together masses of people masses of men masses of material to make uh, a, a concentrated effort to get something built and then something done. That's a pattern that was taken into the expansion of American industry in the decades after the Civil War. So we have from the early 1870s, there's a big depression, 1873, so a little bit slow in developing, but very soon the beginnings of industrial consumer America. Lots more manufacturing, bigger cities, uh, increase of, of uh, tremendous increase in immigrant uh, labor in, in the United States, lots of money being made by lots of people uh, at the upper level, lots of degradation, lots of poverty, lots uh, uh, of strain amongst laboring classes at the lower part. So we, we talk today about income inequality and wealth differentials. It's, it's the post-bellum period. It's the decades after the Civil War that begins that problem. So what do the churches say? And here, I think, is, is a real tragedy. Uh, the Bible is not a textbook in economics, but it has a lot of principles about how to, how to treat other people with consideration and treat particularly those who are less, have less and are less fortunate with, with due consideration. But by and large, with a few exceptions, uh, people are not bringing the, the Bible to bear on the problems of industrial America, labor capital uh, strife, urban America, uh, the ghettoization of, of poverty uh, in the way that they were bringing the Bible to bear on slavery before the Civil War. Now, why, why is that? Why, why this relative silence? Not complete silence, but why this relative silence after the Civil War? My conclusion in the book, and I think, I think it holds up, is that the effort to speak biblically about one set of problems before and during the Civil War that really left the problems up in the air meant a reluctance on many people's part to, to think that there could be a positive Christian active response to the issues, the moral issues created by rapid industrialization, rapid wealth formation, rapid differential in, in, in society. In fact, I, I wrote down here uh, something you wrote in your book that captures exactly what you said there in a, in a fantastic uh, and profound way. You write, the Civil War took the steam out of Protestants' moral energy, which I think is, is what you were just describing. Very, very interesting to, to, to think about. We have been listening to Mark Knoll, author of The Civil War as a Theological Crisis. The book and your understanding and the lessons in it are both very beneficial to the country at this time. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank the you podcast series, Religion and the American Experience, is a project of the National Museum of American Religion. Episodes are released each Monday starting October 19th, 2020, through the end of the year, on Podbean, under Story of American Religion, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify.